What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome. Bite to the channel. Welcome. Bite to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas, and this is BDG Big Dogs. Gotta eat. And we must, we must have not finish up free agency. These are huge moves. This is one of the crazier free agencies I've ever seen. You know, I'm not that old. Pretty fucking old. I'm getting there. But I feel like uh, I'm not being dramatic. Like, that's not hyperbole. This is probably the craziest free agency of our lifetimes. So we need to talk about Deshaun Watson going to Cleveland like a fraud. We need to talk about Allen Robinson and Devontae Adams. All the stuff I didn't catch up on last week. We did an episode last week of, it seems like a year ago at this point. All the things that happened in free agency. I don't even remember who I talked about, right? Like Tom Brady coming by feels like it was 40 years ago. Was that even this season? Was that even this offseason? Or did the video I make about that happen in 2021? I like semi-genuinely mean that. Because there's been so much nonsense happening. All right? And this episode, this feature film, will cover all of that. If you enjoy the video, what you're going to do is hit the button that looks like this. You're going to subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening via podcast, you're going to leave us a five-star rating review because we love you and hopefully you love us. Bike. Y'all know what to do. Let's tuck our shirts in. The Saints are re-signing Jameis Winston to a two-year deal. All right. No surprises there. Uh, let's stop yelling. And let's fight. <laughs> So, uh, Watson hits this little fucking spin zone last minute, signs with the Cleveland Browns. I'm not going to get into it. Broke it. Gun. Yeah, just drill it straight into my heart. Uh, as, as, listen, as a Falcons fan, like, my entire demise has just been televised over the last five years. I don't have anything left. Can you see it in my eyes? Can you see, can you see the lack of anything in my eyes? Like, I was just excited for Deshaun to come to Atlanta so I could feel something, you know? That's kind of where I'm at. But Cleveland decides to guarantee him about a bajillion dollars, re-signs him, gives him a fat new check, and he will be the Browns quarterback for the foreseeable future. Five years, I believe it is. The suspension is still looming, so there's not a lot of concrete, you know, factualities we can drop on you right now in terms of, you know, fantasy rankings and the weapons and stuff around him. But they bring in Amari Cooper, so he's got – this real wide receiver one, which is, you know, about the sexiest Amari Cooper's ever looked in fantasy up to this point in his career. Uh, David Njoku slides into the starting role there with Austin Hooper gone. So he's got an athlete there at a minimum running routes from the tight end position. The ground game is going to be, you know, dynamite as usual with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. I actually sneaky thought Kareem Hunt might be involved in the trade package to Houston, but it didn't happen. So he's bike as well. Now, one of the biggest and I don't want to say overlooked because I feel like most people know this, but one of the biggest things now, and this is what I uh, talked about with the video last week in the first round of free agency and trades and stuff was Russell Wilson going to Denver. The offensive line is is massive for him because now he gets to play behind dudes who can block, you know, for the first time in probably his career. So it's similar, but it's even better for for. Uh, Deshaun going to Cleveland because this is a better offensive line than they have in Denver, but both similar situations where they're going to an upgrade where for a long time the narrative was like, these guys are great quarterbacks, but they don't have time behind their offensive line ever, and now they do, and now Deshaun Watson's going to have all fucking day, and they're not done making moves in free agency because they bring in Amari Cooper, but you got Jarvis. He wants biking just just when they, just when he, just when he thought he was fucking out of here. Deshaun pulls him back in. All right, so we've got Jarvis on the hook. We've got the reports of Will Fuller possibly coming by. I'm uh, not coming by, but, you know, coming to Cleveland, which makes a whole lot of sense, reuniting Will Fuller and reuniting Deshaun Watson together, and they made some magic in Houston, so that would be a great signing for Cleveland, obviously. Now, if, if both of those guys are in Cleveland, what you have on paper is literally a near-perfect offense. You have a superstar quarterback in Deshaun Watson. You have... A very, very good, if not top five, offensive line in the Cleveland Browns. You have a true possession wide receiver one in Cooper. You have a true field stretcher plus in Will Fuller, who we've seen be more than just a field stretcher on the NFL level. You have a, a real, really solid 
slot wide receiver in Jarvis Landry. You have a ridiculously good running back combination in Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, one that excels as a pass catcher. You have an athletic, explosive tight end in Njoku, okay? So assuming Landry and Fuller both sign in Cleveland, where if I had to put my money on, I think they both would. Again, that is a near-perfect offense on paper. Like, they're un-game planable against if you're a defensive coordinator. Now, I don't think there's any reason Deshaun Watson can't be the overall quarterback one in fantasy, okay? Because with that type of offense comes beating. You, you can't, there's, there's no way to stop him from running. There's no way to stop any particular wide receiver because there are so many different options. You can't cheat up on the line of scrimmage. You can't play back because and they can beat you all over the fucking field with this type of offense. Now, they're definitely going to be more pass friendly with Watson under center, which probably means a little bit less volume for Nick Chubb, but I'm just, just don't overthink this one. There's going to be dudes on Twitter that are like, going way too into the analytics of like why Nick Chubb is not going to be a good pick this year. And listen, he's not a first round pick for me. He's going to be picked exactly where he's been picked for the last like three years, which is like early second round, mid second round. I think that's fine, right? Again, don't overthink this. Great offensive line, great running back, great offense. It, it, everything is great about Nick Chubb, all right? It's just a great situation to be in. And for the most part, I think we know what Nick Chubb has been and will be as a fantasy running back, right? He's averaged basically like 15 fantasy points per game, half PPR, over the last like three years as, as he's been like a full-time starter. And uh, he had the one year, so he scored like eight touchdowns his first year, eight touchdowns his second year, had 12 the third year, eight touchdowns his fourth year. So he's a guy who's putting up similar touchdown production like year over year over year. He's averaged the same amount of fantasy points year over year. He had the one big year where he scored the 12 touchdowns and he averaged about a point and a half to two points more per game fantasy-wise, and it was literally indicative of the extra touchdowns, okay? So we're seeing the kind of ceiling that we can probably get from Nick Chubb, and that's very good, but it's not like Christian McCaffrey, Derrick Henry, that type of ceiling. So I think, again, I think we know what we have with Nick Chubb, but I would project him more towards that career season than the average season that he's had now because with this type of offense comes ridiculous scoring opportunities, right? And we see what that does to a guy like James Conner, where even if your volume is average, even if your efficiency is average, if you're getting 15 to 20 goal line carries on the year and you're converting 75 to 80% of them, which Nick Chubb can do, you're going to finish with 13, 14, 15, 16 touchdowns. And that's going to make you a high end RB1, no matter what the fuck you do in the other statistical categories. All right. So again, just don't overthink uh, Nick Chubb, right? And it's going to make him more efficient, but like at the end of the day, we know what he is as a pass catcher, and Kareem Hunt is still there. Now they got to spread the offense around a ton with all these other weapons, assuming that they do sign these other guys. Uh, if they don't, you know, again, there's a lot of moving parts, so we'll see what happens with the pass catchers. If, if nothing does happen there, then we'll recircle bike here, and we'll talk about Cooper and Chubb and all these guys. And, uh, and if they do, we'll also do the same thing. Uh, but Nick Chubb, I mean, listen, like he might go from 5.5 to like 5.9. It's not in, in terms of yards per carry. He might he might set the NFL record for yards per carry, but he's already up there at like 5.5, five, 5.6. Five, five, OK, it doesn't really get much better at an efficiency level than what Nick Chubb brings to the table. Deshaun Watson's obviously going to face a suspension, whether that's four games, eight games, 10 games. Like we don't know right now. So where he ends up in the rankings, where I want to draft him next year is going to be strictly according to the suspension all right he's obviously someone you're going to want to have at the second half of the year so if you're someone who is okay sitting with a guy on your bench and then letting it ride for the remainder of the season or the second half of the season if you have more risk tolerance then Deshaun Watson seems to be the guy for you now Devontae Adams should still be the guy for everybody he goes to the Las Vegas Raiders this is a crazy ass move here man he tells the pack he's not playing without a long-term deal they tried to offer him a long-term deal and he basically said, fuck it. He said, I don't want a long term. He's like, I'm not playing without a long term deal, but I'm also just not playing for y'all. So apparently the Packers actually offered him a bigger deal than the Raiders did. And he still turned it down. He said, fuck it. You know, I just want a new environment. I'm done. I'm done bullshit with Aaron Rodgers is bullshit. And now he reunites with uh, his former college quarterback in Derek Carr. This is from Pro Football Talk, their tweet. Uh, Yesterday, the Texan tweet crowd told you that Devontae Adams was getting a five-year, $141.25 million deal from the Raiders. Today, we'll show you how and why it's most likely a three-year, $67.5 million contract. So again, all these high, top-loaded, huge type of money contracts that we see often, um, you know, it takes like two clicks to really figure out what kind of money we're talking about here where the dead cap hits, where the where the team has an out, where it's team-friendly, where it's player-friendly. Just go to Spotrac, S-P-O-T-R-A-C. You can go check out any actual fucking contracts for these players. And it uh, seems like it's not as big. Regardless, that, that doesn't fucking matter for fantasy football. It's Overall, it's definitely a downgrade for Devontae Adams, both you know QB-wise and, and situationally. Um, I mean, the last time he had target competition 
in Green Bay was like 2000 and fucking 11, right? I'm pretty sure he was in high school at that point. I mean, it's not his fault. He just did what he – it's just like they, they, they don't put anybody uh, uh, opposite him. Of course, he's going to get the ball thrown to him every single time. But going from Rodgers to Carr is like going from first class to economy seats. And that's not really a knock on Derek Carr because, listen, economy seating, like normal normal seating could still be good. Like the, it, Derek Carr is like the, the aisle seat of economy seats and the aisle seat can be good man like you get to, you get a little bit extra leg room you're not like technically supposed to use that as leg room but you could just put your feet out into the fucking aisle every once in a while you might get nipped by a cart you know if there's a cute girl in the row next to you or something you're able to talk to both the person to the left you in the middle seat the window seat and then the person next to you right more possibilities you also get the first chance to go to the bathroom you don't have to keep asking someone to go by so it's like listen there's there's like a it's not great upside but there's definitely a little bit of upside there like there are good parts to having a good economy seat and that's kind of what like Derek Carr is man if you're an optimist at least this is not like the worst situation for him to be in. I don't think it's a bad situation at all okay and here's some facts here here's a here's a fact from last year Derek Carr threw for 689 more passing yards than Aaron Rodgers did last year. And he had 95 more pass attempts than Aaron Rodgers did last year. He had 14 fewer touchdowns than Aaron Rodgers did, okay? But I also think that's as much of a Devontae Adams stat as it is an Aaron Rodgers stat, right? Like Aaron Rodgers, 37, Derek Carr, 23. This year now, flipping Devontae Adams the other side, I think it's extremely reasonable to assume Aaron Rodgers, maybe Aaron Rodgers gives seven touchdowns to Derek Carr, right? And he goes down to 30, Derek Carr goes up to 30, right? If you give seven from Aaron Rodgers, give it to Derek Carr with Devontae Adams there now, you have an even number of passing touchdowns. Derek Carr threw for more yards last year. Derek Carr had more pass attempts last year. Um, those are not obviously predictive of what's going to happen, but like I would not be surprised whatsoever if their statistics are near to what they are. And obviously Derek Carr is in, in a situation that's much, much better than Green Bay, and that's you know tit for tat. They're not the same fucking quarterback, and Aaron Rodgers is way better. But fantasy-wise, statistically, like given the situations, I mean, listen, Derek Carr – is a really intriguing pocket passer for fantasy. He's pro I don't know if I could put him into my top 12 because you're going to have a lot of guys like Trey Lance and Justin Fields kind of like bordering that top 12 area that have a lot higher upside than Derek Carr. But listen, like if you were drafting Kirk Cousins or if you were drafting those types of guys last year, then you're fine drafting Derek Carr this year and probably a little bit more upside because we've seen big, I mean, through for 4,800 yards last year without Devontae Adams and with Darren Waller hurt for a lot of the year. So he's definitely, definitely a viable fantasy streamer if not high in qb2 for super flex leagues now for adams he's still clear wide receiver one for me man um he always will be he moves over to las vegas where you know like i said green bay no no target competition for the guy in vegas he's got darren waller okay so that's a i'm not gonna sit here and act like fucking people are gonna be like oh he's got darren waller and then they start wasting their breath i'm like oh he's competing with hunter renfro it's like okay I get it. Hunter Renfro had a cute little like month, six weeks last year. But imagine, imagine actually thinking Hunter Renfro impacts the target volume of Devontae Adams. Like, what are we talking about here? That's that reach is so fucking far. That reach is is cringeworthy saying that like Devontae Adams now competing with Hunter Renfro for like, no, he's not. Devontae Adams will literally eat Hunter Renfro for dinner. Leftovers, midnight fucking snack Hunter Renfro. All right, we uh we are not getting on board with that narrative that Hunt for Renfro hurts Devontae fucking Adams, okay? It ain't happening. Now, with Waller there as a true, you know, field stretcher, it's hard to see Devontae Adams come by the type of upside in Green Bay where it was like on a, a 170 target season upside um, where he was competing with MVS as like his top. You know what's the insane part about this? Devontae Adams had two seasons where he had, you know, at or just below 170 targets. It was 2018 and last year in 2021. In both of those seasons, those were four years apart, four seasons apart, and in both of those seasons, MVS was his top competing pass catcher. Like the Packers could not add one real compliment to Devontae Adams in four fucking years. Oh, that's literally impressive by the front office. No wonder he wanted to get the fuck out of there. So with Adams, it's like it's still in the top five for me as a fantasy wide receiver. He's just not in the top of the top five, right? It was like Cooper Cup, in his own tier and if you wanted to argue that you would take Devonte adams like right there with cooper cup i would have heard it i would have heard you out in your argument it would have been probably poor but i would have heard it now he moves into i think the second tier right behind cooper cup is you know like jamar chase justin jefferson Devonte adams and i think you could argue adams still at, like the wide receiver two spot uh, i think people are going to blow out the target competition like out of proportion and not understand just how good of a chemistry Devonte adams and Derek Carr are going to have as well as just how good Devonte adams is even without Aaron Rodgers. 
So he's still in that tier. If you want to argue that he's the wide receiver four, right? Like I'm completely fine with that still. Um, but if you want to have him up at wide receiver two, he's just, he's just in that tier. So I'll take whatever of those three wide receivers drop to the wide receiver four slots. Um, so again, for Aaron Rodgers, it's obviously a downgrade for him. If you look at the other players on Green Bay, Alan Lazard, I guess, becomes intriguing. Amari Rodgers becomes a little bit intriguing. But realistically, we're all going to sit here. We have no idea what's going to come out of this situation. And most of the times when it's like ambiguous situations with players, we don't know who's going to take the top spot and none of them have really proven anything. It ends up being someone that we never really saw coming or no one ends up like controlling the top spot. And they're all like really shaky wide receiver fours. And I feel like we might see that happen this year in Green Bay now. They have a lot of the Raiders picks and they have their own picks. So if you look at their 2022 NFL draft picks, at least the top half of the draft, they have four picks within the top 60. So they have the 22nd from the Raiders. They have their own 28th, the 53rd from the Raiders, and then the 59th is their own. So uh, there's no way they don't come away with at least one high end wide receiver from those four picks. I would you know, hope that they draft at least two from those four picks. And those rookies, because Aaron Rodgers is now signed to an extension, will have uh, you know, the best quarterback tied to them for their entire rookie contract makes their value through the fucking roof. So uh, if it's guy, if it's a guy like Traylon Burks or Drake London or Garrett Wilson or whatever, I mean, they were already at the top of rookie drafts, but now it just cements them probably as a wide receiver one in the class. If it was guys like Chris Olave or whatever, then, you know, that shoots them up into a tier probably uh, amongst the other guys. But who I do think is a huge, huge winner for this is Aaron Jones, man. If he just looks at uh, look at the splits from from his career in games with and without Devontae Adams, he's always been such a huge fucking piece of that passing offense when Devontae Adams has been hurt. Like four and a half receptions per game, half a receiving touchdown. Uh, just the target numbers go through the fucking roof when Devontae Adams is not on the field. So Aaron, Aaron Jones, huge, huge, huge winner. Cincinnati Bengals offensive line completely revamped. Lyle Collins, Alex Kappa, Ted Karras. Like they went out and they spent it, man. And uh this is the, you know, they didn't get, like, Lyle Collins is is definitely a very, very good player. Uh, suspension last year, dealt with some injuries and whatever. This is uh, very reminiscent of the Rams four or five years ago, the Browns two, three years ago, when they went out in free agency, spent and flipped their entire O-line around. Went from one of the worst to one of the first, okay? And that's exactly what Cincinnati did, and it was beautiful. And uh, I tweeted out yesterday jokingly, like, oh, they should have drafted Penny Sewell. Because there's still people, like, talking about how Penny Sewell was a bad draft pick compared to Jamar Chase. And, uh, sorry, a fucking bird caught my eye. Like, what was I saying? Um, yeah, so I, I tweeted out yesterday, you know, they should have just drafted Penny Sewell and, uh, and signed Cedric Wilson in free agency instead of drafting Jamar Chase and signing these offensive. You see, there's so many more offensive linemen available in free agency than there are top-end wide receivers. Like, there's always a wide receiver market. Most of the time, they're not top end, but offensive linemen, you could really revamp your your uh, your group there through free agency. And the Cincinnati Bank, it, I mean, fuck, it's hard not to fall in love with everybody in this offense. The only missing piece they had was the offensive line, and now that shit is closed up. Joe Burrow, Chase Higgins, I mean, not, most probably most impacted is Joe Mixon, man. Like, hard not to have him as like a top five, six fantasy running back. I didn't have him up there beforehand, but good Lord, that offensive line. All right, uh, Allen Robinson to the L.A. Rams. Now, the Rams are dealing with two of their premier wide receivers in both Robert Woods and Odell Beckham Jr. dealing with late-season torn ACLs. They masterfully did this free agency, man. Replaced them with Allen Robinson, three years, $46.5 million. Robinson is 28. So he's not out of his prime whatsoever. He definitely sells another three really, really solid years out of him. The question becomes, like, is Robinson actually as good as he used to be? Um, I feel like a lot of the fall off last year was just him just being completely demotivated. And it's hard not to be when you're playing in fucking Chicago and the way they've built that offense. I just didn't feel like he wanted to be there. I didn't feel like he wanted to play his best football while he was there. I felt like he just didn't, I want to say he didn't, like, try hard, but... But I don't not want to say that, right? And I think, like, the QB excuse is definitely one that you can use, and it's valid. But, like, Darnell Mooney had no problem fucking balling out last year. Like, again, the, the, the QB thing is valid for Allen Robinson is why he didn't play well, like, up to a certain point. When you have other guys doing it in the same situation, you start to question it. But, again, I do think a lot of it was, like, a desire not to just, like, kill yourself out on the field for the Chicago Bears – at this point, I think we're going to see a rejuvenated Al Robinson in L.A. with Matt Stafford, who got the extension as well. So I'm I'm on board with Allen Robinson in 
2022 fantasy football for sure. Now, Al Robinson gets to play Darnell Mooney to Cooper Cup, okay? So in my opinion, there's no impact on Cooper Cup, okay? Like he was already eating while he was sharing the field with Robert Woods and Van Jefferson and Odell Beckham. So like nothing changes when it comes to Cooper Cup for me. He's not impacted. It's still the wide receiver one overall. Woods gets shipped to Tennessee, and that opens up a lot of targets. It opens up a lot of versatility and volume for Robinson to step in and grab that shit like immediately. Now, for Robinson, in terms of fantasy, like where I draft him, he kind of falls into exactly where I think Robert Woods was going, where it was like back end wide receiver too. It's going to be interesting to see how they deploy him because he's not the same player as Robert Woods. Like Robert Woods is very, very versatile. He's very fluid. He's a guy who just like runs routes over the middle and you can give him screen passes and you could give him the end of rounds and stuff. And that's not who Allen Robinson is. He's way more of like a possession wide receiver. So the way I look at Robinson is more like, I think his upside is probably like wide receiver 15 in this offense, barring like a 13 to 15 touchdown season, which is probably, you know, in the cards. But for me, I'm I'm looking at Robinson as like the wide receiver 18 to 24 in draft. So like a wide receiver two that I'm not like dying to go out and draft just because I do still have some questions based on, you know, his age and how he's played over the last couple of years. Um, and he's not the alpha there, so he's not going to be the Allen Robinson that we've always wanted and projected him to be, for fantasy at least. Uh, so I think, you know, it's not a guy I'm going to be drafting every single time if he's there at like wide receiver 20, but he's definitely a guy I want a share or two of in case he does go fucking vintage on us. When it comes to Odell, I do think they re-signed him, but he tore his ACL in the Super Bowl. Uh, it's going to be a minute before he's back on the field, or at least a minute before he's like, you know, 100% back on the field. And like, who knows if ever, this is another massive, massive injury. I had, I had really, really big concerns from coming into last year coming you know he's a fractured his ankle he's torn his ACL like he's done so many major major injuries and the older you get the harder it is to fully recover and become that explosive player you were when you were 22 23 24 whatever um so like Odell Beckham is pretty much off my radar right now as, as fantasy is concerned Van Jefferson man like he's just one of those guys that I don't think people are ever going to accept who he is like Van Jefferson is just who he is he's a guy who's a role player that can have boom weeks Right, like just because he can have boom weeks does not mean make he's a, make him a good fantasy player. That's eighty five percent of NFL players. Like it's the reason anyone likes any player is because they've had a boom week, and you say, oh, he could do this. But what separates Van Jeffersons from the guys who get Allen Robinson type contracts is high level of production consistently over a long fucking period of time. And like, there's no uh, what's the difference between Van Jefferson and Marquez Valdez Scantling other than MBS has been in the league long enough for you to actually fucking accept what they are. Okay. So Van Jefferson, whatever, he'll have the wide receiver three roll until Odell comes back. And the fact that we already know that as soon as Odell's back, he's taking Van Jefferson's spot, should tell you all you need to fucking know. So Van Jefferson, whatever, wide receiver four or five. He's, he's, he is what he fucking is at this point, all right? Robert Woods goes to Tennessee, and I fucking love this signing for Tennessee. I love this trade for them. They gave up like a sixth, which is beautiful. He signed the contract extension, which is a little bit of what goes into why the compensation for it is is really nothing here. But this gives them a real wide receiver too behind A.J. Brown, man, and we got two great yak players on the field, so you could still run the ball or run the offense through running the ball, and Ryan Tannehill, you know, on the move, play action-wise, because you have two guys that can move really well in open field. I, I think this is one of the most underrated moves. This off, There's been so much, like, craziness that's happened this offseason that this one kind of went a little bit under the radar in terms of the upside, I think it could actually bring to the Tennessee Titans as a football team. And like they had Corey Davis, they had, Julio was nothing last year. But Corey Davis was like a fine wide receiver too. And AJ Brown broke out. But Corey Davis is not versatile. You can't really do anything with him in the offense other than like tell him to run very typical routes, man. Um, with Woods though, of course he suffered the torn ACL in November and they're already like, he's going to be back by training camp. So it's like, okay, so the beat reporters are moving scientific timelines from nine to 12 months down to six months just because they feel like saying that. So that's fucking dumb take number one. So they can just fucking relax. All right. Week one, definitely in the cards. I think he can be back on the field, but even Robert Woods is coming out and really like emphasizing, you know, the need for patience before he feels like he's more than medically cleared and actually ready to play football again. That's such a big part of the ACL tears is not just being physically okay, but like mentally okay too. So he knows not to not to to rush back into it. And, you know, we'll probably start hearing more reports like towards the summer of when his return will be. Um obviously we're getting more and more used to these players coming back quickly. For fantasy, he's a really tough sell in 2022, man. Like coming coming back from the ACL at age 29, moving to a team that's been bottom three in the league in pass rate in four straight seasons, it's not a great outlook for him, okay? So 
he's like an efficient, low ceiling wide receiver three in fantasy when he's healthy. So I love the move for Tennessee in real football. I, in fantasy, it's really hard to get excited about it. It's 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 hard to get excited about Woods. It's hard to get excited about Juju Smith Schuster, even to the Kansas City Chiefs. It's an interesting signing. It's one year, ten point seven five million. The truth, as Pro Football Talk said, it's a one year, three point two five million dollar deal with. A huge amount of that 10.5 in incentives. It's pretty much what Juju should have done last season. He wanted a prove it deal in 2021 and he got it and he proved to us that he's a moron because he should have just done this shit last year. And now he's in Kansas City. And I mean, I think it's a great move for, for both sides, right? It's a great low risk move for Kansas City. And it's somewhere that he can resurrect his career. Of course, he gets to play with Mahomes. He gets to play with both Mahomes, one on TikTok, one in, you know, on the football field, hopefully. And they get a wide receiver, too, a guy that can actually be a wide receiver, too, for them that could run the slot and underneath routes and be a really, really good like dump-off option for Patrick Mahomes and kind of do what Sammy Watkins did, where he's running a lot of routes over the middle and you know can play that possession receiver role. And now Juju has been an easy fade for me over the last two years in fantasy. I felt very, very obvious to me. People like being like, well, that was wrong because he was a fucking he was the wide receiver eighteen in uh, fantasy points per or, or fantasy points overall. Oh fuck. So like Juju, people love to be like, oh, yeah, in twenty twenty, he was like the wide receiver eighteen in full fucking point PPR. And it's like, it's such a fucking reach to prove a terrible, terrible point. Like, once you start pinpointing all these settings and, like, things, uh, you know, you're just, it's just take the fucking L, man. Like, I know some people play full PPR, but, like, to have to announce it and tell a player that, like, like that's the league setting that he was good in. When you start looking at his points in terms of, like, points per game, he drops from, like, the wide receiver 18 down to, like, a wide receiver 29. And then once you're in that range, you're literally a replaceable player. So the argument people make about Juju two years ago, about him being the wide receiver 18, full PBR, overall points, is a really, it's 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 almost like a counterpoint. Because again, he drops down to like 28 in full in, in points per game, and and you're looking at a replacement level player, and I actually just wanted to make sure I, I fucking bite this up. There are so many players that can score double-digit fantasy points in PPR leagues. Like, literally on average, 51 wide receivers. Over the last, I went back and looked at the last five seasons. I want to see how many wide receivers average double digit full PPR points per game. 51. 51 per year. So if you draft a wide receiver three or a four in full PPR leagues, they are available on the waiver wire. Okay. So once you get down to a certain ranking, like the wide receivers make very little difference. They're so, so nominal in terms of like the wide receiver 28 compared to the wide receiver 39. Like it seems like a big jump, but it's literally like one PPR point per game and they're all over the waiver wire, okay? So with Juju, listen, this I'm not going to say he's like a target of mine this year, but I won't be fading him like I was the last couple of years. I do think he'll reinvigorate himself a little bit. I think he will have a nice little season in Kansas City. I think a lot of people will make up an upside that he has that he doesn't actually have. And I, I think he'll probably end up going in the wide receiver three range, uh, which is a really tough area to choose from this year in fantasy in particular, because you have like on the higher end of wide receiver threes, as of right now, you probably have like DK Metcalf, who, you know, I'm saying this because he doesn't have a quarterback right now. So he's probably like in the wide receiver 24, 25, 26 range. Then you got guys, you know, like Adam Thielen and Michael Pittman and Tyler Lockett, Jerry Judy, Kadarius Toney, Devonta Smith, Gabe Davis. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of names on that list I'd probably take over Juju. And again, we're like purely speculating on the fact that we hope he can recapture what he did like four years in his in his pre TikTok days, man. And I just I don't know if I could buy that narrative, man. I don't I don't I don't know. You know, it, it's like if we need to convince ourselves a player is back to what he was years ago, it always like kind of rubs me the wrong way and I hesitate to buy into those guys. So I'm not gonna be targeting Juju. But I don't think he's an active fade for me this year. I think it's a great football signing for both sides. Like Juju gets to prove himself, and there's no excuse he can make to uh, to say like, "Oh, is this fall or that fall?" Because he's in an offense with an unbelievable quarterback and a great you know system. And if he fails this year, then you know he's just, he just is what he is at this point. Um, but it's it's a situation where he can you know perform really well, and then they can resign him to a fat contract, or he can get one elsewhere. So I like the move for for Juju. I like the move for KC. It's fine for fantasy. Like, obviously, if you're a Juju owner in Dynasty, then you are uh, really happy because you can't really find a better landing spot than with Patrick Mahomes where there's not a real fucking wide receiver two there. So 
that's what I got for y'all. Um, I probably missed some free agent signings. I saw Gerald Everett go somewhere. He got signed. I think it was the, I don't know, dude. I don't know. Uh, Duke Johnson goes to Buffalo, which kind of muddies the backfield a little bit. They're saying that they got the like J.D. McKissick replacement. J.D. McKissick was actually going to be a big problem in that backfield because he was going to be a specialist pass catcher. I don't necessarily know that Duke Johnson is that much better of a pass catcher than like Devin Singletary is. Uh, maybe he plays a bit of a role there, but like I don't think there are any other really impactful free agent signings that I missed. If I did, y'all will let me know in the comments section. Uh, let me know what you think about the film today. As always, hit the button that looks like this if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to Zai channel. If you are new, as we get more free agency drops, you will get more featured film drops. Thank you for watching. And make sure if you are listening via podcast, you leave a rating and review because I love you.